Okay, good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to the Board of Commissioners meeting for July 6, 2022. Uh, we're going to begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay. We have, um, <clears throat> as we usually do, we have some presentations um, to start off our meeting. Um, and we are honored to be uh, celebrating uh, athletics, uh, both um, the younger version and the older version <laughs> of athletics. Um, we are honored to have with us today uh, some champions, um, and we're you know, proud not only of the hard work they've put in representing uh, their schools, uh, their families, uh, their counties, their coaches, et cetera, um, but um, you know, certainly they represent the county. And so we do have uh, a f at least two here, I think. I don't know if there was gonna be some other who may be here, we weren't quite sure of, um, uh, if they're going to make it. But um, we're going to start out just by honoring uh, our first athlete here, who is Gary Martin. Uh, Gary Martin is a um, graduate of Archbishop Wood High School. He is going to be on his way to University of Virginia. Um, Gary um, made uh, some history. Um, for those that are runners, um, they understand that the four-minute mile was at one point um, an unbroachable you know, barrier back 70 years ago. So Roger Bannister, a British uh, right, uh, um, runner, was the first one to break it, which people thought was impossible. The human body couldn't go uh, that fast, couldn't go for that, that length of time. And yet, we have in our midst a young man who broke that barrier. Um, runners like you understand how to separate competition from the people around you on both the track and on the sidelines, Gary. You're a sub four minute miler, the sixth fastest miler in the United States high school history. Um, and you even found time to race the Philly Fanatic, which I'm hoping you won that race because he doesn't seem like he's in the same shape as you. But um, we are honored to have Gary here and um, the commissioners like to present you with this letter of commendation. So if you want to come forward, we'd be happy to. <laughs> Do I say something? Go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone real quick. I'm not going to say much. I'm going to keep it short. But the support from everyone in the county and the area means a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Come on. <laughs> okay, congratulations and good luck. That's great. <laughs> Sure, yeah. yeah, just just a, a quick comment, and I see uh, old track and field coach Andy Warren is, is out in the audience today. Uh, so Andy realizes how special this young man is. And uh, I was involved earlier coaching my kids in track and field and uh, cross country, and uh, my son went to one of the local high schools, Anthony, and uh, he actually won, uh, I think his conference mile run with four, I think it was 421 was the fastest he ever ran in the mile, which was, you know, really good. And everybody looked up, I mean, that's a, that's a really good time. So what this young man, Gary, you've been able to accomplish under four minute mile in high school is nothing short of sensational. And I 
just want to congratulate you and mom, you should be so proud. You really should. It, it doesn't get much better than this sitting here watching your young man being recognized. So congratulations to you and the family and, and coach. Congratulations to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, our second honoree, uh, Sanaya Hebron is here. Sanaya is a graduate of Neshaminy High School. She's on her way to the University of Miami. Um, athletes like her understand the importance of support from her coaches, her teammates, family, and friends. At the PIAA Track and Field Championship, she won gold in the 300 hurdles, took second in the 200 meter dash. And on top of that, she also took second in the 400 hurdles at the USA Track and Field U20 Outdoor Championships and at the New Balance Nationals. Uh, so quite the achievement. Uh, we are honored to have Zanaya here, and we have a accommodation for you. She says she wants to speak. Um, I wanted to start off by saying thank you for having me. Um, I'm very grateful for my family, um, the support from the Shamini and my dote. And I'm looking forward to heading to Miami and making Pennsylvania proud. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> That's why I said the joke. Um, we also have um, certificates to honor the 4x400 relay team from CB West. I don't know if any of them are here. No? Okay. All right. Well, I'll just mention uh, Claire Dalsis, Mimi Duffy, Mayoe McFadden, Kate Edinson, um, a relay team uh, that, again, took first place PIAA track and field championships in the 4x400 relay and second at the Penn Relays. So we have certificates for them as well, commendations for them as well. We'll make sure they get those. So and we tried to reach out and, and get them uh, through their coach. Obviously, vacations and things like that is tough. So uh, thanks to our staff for putting that together. Um, next, going to sort of the different end of the spectrum, uh, we want to recognize our area agency in aging and the senior games. Uh, so I think uh, Kathy Bennett's here. or is, Who's? Oh, uh, Bill, all right. Ty's going to come up. Morning, Commissioners. Morning. Morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity to give a wrap up of the 39th Annual Senior Games this year. They were scheduled from June 1 through the 17th, and they were preceded by a kickoff event on May 25th. The Senior Games are open to persons age 50 plus, and a couple of events were open to all generations. They offer friendly contests that challenge a broad range of physical ability and mental skills in independent group and virtual settings. And to achieve their objective, Bucks County Senior Games are designed to promote socialization and learning. For example, they included clinics in disc golf and pickleball. And the kickoff event provided dozens of opportunities to experience new games, learn about community resources, and even offered free knee, knee screenings by a, an orthopedic surgeon. The senior Games have powerful impacts. They invigorate participants, they bring together old acquaintances, they foster new relationships, they bring out the best in our community. We see this through the awesome support of our partners 
the generosity of our financial and in-kind donors, and the truly remarkable dedication and commitment of our volunteers. The Senior Games unite us. Now I'm going to share an overview of the Senior Games and the kickoff event, a few highlights about our participants and supporters, and pictures that convey the Senior Games' essence far beyond the power of words. Randy? Okay, next. Next. Okay, the kickoff event in the Senior Games, our partners included the Bucks County Foundation for Aging, the Community College, and the Bucks County Department, Department of Parks and Rec. And we had many sponsors. We had 20 financial sponsors, 52 in-kind, and 17 golf club sponsors. Next. Uh, planning and implementation of the games was done by a senior games committee of 18 people. And uh, the event volunteers numbered 40. Um, we had some expert help putting together some of the events for the games. We had local PIAA officials for track and field. We had the Bucks County Disc Golf Alliance. And the person from the Disc Golf Alliance, Joe Mella, actually has been playing disc golf since the 1980s. He's got 136 professional golf disc wins, and uh, he's also in the Hall of Fame for Pennsylvania Disc Golf and the National uh, Hall of Fame for Disc Golf. We had the Delaware Valley Orienteering Association and the Delaware Valley University Center for, in for Learning and Retirement helped us as well for the virtual events. Next. The kickoff event was attended by 200 people, or more actually, 32 exhibitors, and some of the featured events included Zumba, learning chess and cornhole. We actually had demonstrations and tables set up where people could, could learn and, and practice these, uh, these skills. Next. Senior Games had 355 participants. There were 345 medals awarded, and there were 29 events. Three were independent, there were three virtual, and 23 were live. Next. And as I say, the uh, people age 50 plus uh, participate in these games. And some of, the, uh, some of the games included bicycling, billiards, bocce, bowling, chess, darts, disc golf, regular golf, orienteering, pickleball, quays, horseshoes, steps competition, football and softball toss, uh, running, jumping, uh, walking, and virtual games that included fill in the, the blanks for the lyrics and uh, a scavenger hunt. Here's a sample of the medals, and the, the, the ones that are featured mostly are the, the new medals. The uh, prior year's medals are, are in the background. But the thing that's, that's fun about the medals, aside from actually being able to award them to, to people in the various age groups, is that one of the people, Kathleen Kelly, has a, a big family picnic every year. And the medals that she's earned, she puts up as a competition for her grandkids to, to earn and, and to win. So she puts them to good use. Next. This gentleman here is uh, George Shackett. Uh, may be hard to believe, but he's 96 years old. <laughs> and uh, yeah, next. And we had the opportunity to uh, present him with a picture from 1998. Next slide. That's him competing in 1998. So uh, it's really remarkable. He's, uh, he's a great fan of the games and a participant. Next. This is Jeannie Barney. Jeannie grew up in a small town. Um, well, she's 77 now, so it was quite some time ago. But uh, she has with her her mascot. And she's dressed the mascot up in senior games garb. And also, every year, the people who participate in the games get a senior games pin. And her mascot is, uh, is adorned with over 21 pins. Um, Jeannie had a, a couple of comments that uh, I'd really like to present to you. And I think it really just gives the essence of what, what the games really mean to her and to so many others. It's, it's so great to see people my age, many younger and some older, enjoying themselves in friendly competitions. It is a chance to meet new people, catch up with friends from previous years, and share good times. The spirit of camaraderie is alive at every event, whether it's picking up bocce balls for an opponent who has trouble bending low, sharing tips on how to do better on cheering each other on. And I felt acceptance and friendliness in every event that I've participated in to earn my 359 medals. Okay, next. 
Another picture of Jeannie. Okay. This gentleman is, uh, is Terry, and he has his seeing eye dog, Twain. So as you would surmise, Terry is blind. He completed the uh, one mile walk at track and field, was awarded the gold medal, and for the first time in history, we awarded an animal a gold medal, his dog <laughs> Twain, so. Next. And this little girl was there with her grandparents and uh, she seemed to be really enjoying herself. She watched people getting medals and we thought it would be a good thing to do for her, so she's got herself a gold medal. Next. Now, the next series of slides will, will kind of progress by themselves, but you'll see track and field and disc, uh, disc golf, football toss, and many of the, here's a disc golf shot. Many of them will speak for themselves. I think what we're, what we're really seeing here is the people being together, being happy. Um, it's just a great experience for people overall. Uh, and there are many more pictures of this kind. Uh, you can run them as, as, as you see fit. But, you know, it's a great, it's a great experience for, for the uh, attendees and, and really for the agency and all of our partners to be able to put, put this type of event on. So I appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, as you can tell, a lot of work goes in uh, on, uh, from our area agency and aging on all the planning, organizing, securing the venues, um, getting the word out, organizing all the competitions, um, getting the sponsorships, et cetera. So a, a big uh, you know, thank you uh, to Kathy and Bill and, and their staff. Um, and now you know, Gary and Sanaya have something to for, aim at for like in 40 years. You can you know, see how you do and uh, you, know, you can get those medals uh, with whatever competitions you want to go into. Okay, all right, <clears throat> so we're moving into public comment. Um, we do have a new system in terms of signing up. <clears throat> so uh, just a reminder, for, this is the first cutout comment time period is on agenda items. Um, we do ask that people comment on agenda items themselves. Um, First person. We have. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate having us all. Thank you. <laughs> First person on agenda items is Andy Warren. Good morning to you all. Fantastic to be uh, in the company of phenomenal athletes, high school and beyond. And as soon as I'm old enough, I'm looking forward to the <laughs> senior games. Um, the, the, the gentleman from Wood, uh, Fantastic, fantastic. The only thing wrong with his achievements was he went to Wood instead of William Tennant. <laughs> He's in the right township. And of course, the Chamonix, where Diane and I pay our taxes, we're right up there. My questions for you today on the agenda um, are four questions. Item number one, what is Appendix F? Item number three, the right to know officers, are they present employees? And I'm assuming that that doesn't entail extra pay. I'm, I'm just assuming. Item 10E, 
Last week, or June 15th, last meeting, item 9i had the exact same dollar figure to be used for um, something else. Oh, I, I guess it was the uh, uh, signing bonuses, retention bonuses. Now it's for programs it's, or, or vice versa. The question is, what happened in the ensuing two weeks? Did, was, did someone find, determined, oh, we couldn't use the money for this category, so therefore we'll use it for this one? What, what occurred in the last two weeks? And item 18, what, what type of a V, not what type, what's involved on a vehicle that's $400,000? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Next name, I'm waiting for the thing to recycle here. Next name on the agenda is Diane Marie Herring. Good morning, commissioners. Morning. Um, I would like to address item 3, A-O-O-R-O, the agency open records officer. Um, I noted that last month, the uh, officer Rick left the position. It's taken us a month to replace them. We understand we're in violation of the law, correct? The right to know law clearly states that an agency must at all times have declared open records officer. I know that also the county has taken it upon themselves to upend the entire process for submitting right to know request. And for pretty much the first 60 days of your system, it did not send the request or a copy. Again, a violation of the law. What I find really interesting is we are on agency number three, open records officer in 11 months. I've never seen a public agency go through so many. One has to ask why. I've submitted several requests. I currently am in, however, possession of an email thread that has gone unanswered since January. And I'm tired. I'm very tired of watching these meetings month after month and nothing changes. We have people who have used this county's email system for personal political gain. I have an email that proves it. I have an email that proves the county email system was used to set up a Zoom session to discuss an employee of the county and their performance. And more importantly, I have an email that went unanswered from a Sunday in August in which the county used all of its resources to muster all of its public communication people to go to the press to sabotage every single elected school board director in this county. And I have that email. What I find really interesting though is now that we have a new one coming, um, is the new one gonna answer my right to know request that's on a 30 day extension due this Friday on time? Or will I be sued also? Because in the last 10 years of public records, you guys went 10 years without suing one person in this county for a right to know. Since 2020, you've sued seven. Your appeals record, however, is even more interesting. In 10 years, you had a total of 64 appeals at the state. In 10 years. In two, since 2020, You've had 91. I really would love to know what is so earth shatteringly important here that it can't be disclosed. What really are you hiding? I mean, I've got tons of emails already. I'm not giving up, I'm not going away. 
You guys are using county resources, taxpayer funds, and you're doing all sorts of things you shouldn't be doing on it. But most importantly, you did it and you hurt kids. You hurt kids. That's where I got to step in then. I kept my mouth shut for a long time. And a lot of people know I've spoken up for a long time about right to know in schools. I kept my mouth shut for a long time around here. But after the latest round, and now you're suing soccer moms? You're suing them. Because they asked what happened to their kids and why their kids had to be quarantined and why their kids had to be masked. You lost. You lost in Harrisburg. But you still won't turn over the records. So now you sue them. I'm really looking forward to meeting the new open records officer. I hope they last longer than the last three have. Sarah Bauer. Hi, my name is Sarah Bauer. I live in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. I've been silent too long. I'd really like to know why you are hiding emails from a private citizen and using my tax money to sue them. Why? What's so earth shattering? This happened before to the same person. She got sued by the school district. It didn't end well for the school district. The superintendent resigned and the board president resigned. We want transparency in this county. Citizens have a right to know what's going on. We live here, we pay taxes, we all pay taxes here. You're using our tax money to sue a citizen? I want to know why. Why? Thank you. Edward Mackhouse. Here. Here. I'm Edward Mackhouse from Buckingham. I'd like to compliment you when you joined together with Chester County and Dr. Thamsker and stood up to Biden, Wolf, Shapiro, and Fetterman, and the big pharmacy, and demanded that they open the schools and not shut down everything. But now people want to know why you buckled down to the pressures and now went against the people. And so people are as mad as hell and want to know why you were doing this. Mr. Mackhouse. The purpose of the open I'm, records. OK, you're out top. The purpose right, of the open records is to show that everything is up above ground. So you're appointing some people open records people. So the idea is that you have nothing to hide, that you are honest and integrity. You want good elections. And I believe that you are much superior to Montgomery County. The, the movie 2,000 Mules shows that there, there were 2,000 mules who went from mailbox to mailbox, uh, drop box, dropping in, shown by the videos, stealing elections. You're only supposed to put in one box. They put in three or four boxes and 24 different drop boxes. So I, they said there was 1,000 out of the 2,000 stealing in the critical elections were from Philly. And Montgomery County was also mentioned. Mr. Mackhouse, you have to, if you're going to focus on open records, you have to focus on open records. The open records, people are, are doing it for Montgomery County and Bucks County. So I think that <clears throat> it's possible that you are withholding records. You can't be perfect if there's thousands of records. It's understandable that some of those records could be wrong, or you, could, you should say if the record is right and you stand by it. You should say if you no longer, you made a mistake on it, or you no longer support it. But we want to know what your position is on this. And we believe that everyone has some good in their heart and wants to do right. And so we want to know what is your position. We feel that people are as mad as hell. They want to know what's happening. If you release this records, is that going to clear up and make people happy that you've been honest and non-corrupt and very good? Or is it going to remove the doubt of the people of the corruption and stuff? So we think you should do everything you can to remove the doubts that people have about the election integrity, about corruption. Some people feel that all politicians are corrupt. I don't. 
I feel everyone goes into politics with good intentions, and you work hard, harder than I could work, and you're trying to do what is right. But we don't say you could be perfect, but we want you to look at, release all the records. And it's public records, public accounts. Do the best you can with it. We can't say everyone, you find a lot of records. Some of them are going to be wrong and mistakes, all kinds of things. But we want your position, and we believe that you entitled to it, and the people are entitled to a response. You can't individually respond to every person, but in general, like Dr. Dampshire worked very hard, and we, people in Montgomery County lost two years of school, so their school children were retarded two years. Thanks to Dr. Damsker and other people, Central Bucks, Central Bucks did not lose so much schooling. And everyone agrees that shutting down the schools was horrible to children. And the masking is horrible too, because children can't learn to speak properly, and they can't see how the teachers are enunciating things. So the harm from this, this mask mandates and this big pharmacy shutting down everything was much less in Bucks County than in Montgomery County and some other counties, thanks to the work of Dr. Damsker. And we want, believe that you have integrity. And we want you to release the things, even if it incriminates Wolf, Shapiro, Fetterman, and some other people. We think you are covering up for other people. We think you, good in your heart. You went with Chester County, and you should stand up and again, stand up against them. And thank you for all your service and everyone here. I think it's very important to have the public comments and to bring out the things and feelings of the people. And the, the open records, spending thousands of dollars fighting, it just makes it, people more and more suspicious that you have things to hide. And then they start all the conspiracy theories. So please do your duty and openly support what you believe to be right. Thank you very much for all the students for us. Uh, Rich Walker. There is an agenda item to hire Ashley Dayoub as the Right to Know Coordinator. By now, everything concerning Right to Knows that involve the commissioners should be under heightened scrutiny. I don't know how long Ashley Dayoub has been the, uh, dealing with Right to Knows, but in the short time since the previous administrator left, there were already disturbing findings. Out of her office came two lawsuits, two lawsuits a week ago against my wife. Maybe my wife is super bad and deserves to be sued by you twice. When she told me about it, I was like, Jamie, what did you do? Like, did you get sued twice? But then looking at the lawsuits, they were the exact same thing. You filed the same complaint twice. Sent the court two filing fees. Spent time and money on two suits. Reviewed the two suits. Is that who should be in charge of right to knows? But this is not an isolated incident from our current commissioners. They, and specifically Commissioner Merseglia, have unleashed a campaign of threats and intimidation against Megan Brock and Jamie Walker. Commissioner Merseglia referred to them as suicide triggers in a presentation to Central Buck School District. <clears throat> That's on videotape. It's on videotape. She also referred to them in a commissioner's meeting as insurrectionists because they asked for emails. That's on videotape also. The head of Bucks County Security told them to stop coming to any more meetings because they were stirring up trouble for the commissioners. You probably remember that it occurred right there. That's on videotape also. Is that a First Amendment violation? You're telling her not to come to the meetings and speak? Commissioner Harvey, you likened your situation to Civil War General Sherman. He had his part in ending the war, but the South does not look fondly of him. Especially South Carolina, we admitted to punishing them for starting the war, and he damaged that state for a generation. Commissioner Merseglia, you stated about yourself 
that heavy is the head that wears the crown. So I'm assuming you think you are a king or a queen, none of which exists in American society. But throughout history, that leadership style has led to great abuses of power. And Commissioner D. Girolamo, you say nothing. Your silence speaks volumes about your role in these activities. When is someone, anyone, going to look into what they are doing? Does every elected official in Bucks County think their actions are appropriate? It appears that everyone condones their behavior, and that is a sad statement for the future of Bucks County. In conclusion, whatever role Ashley has currently, you feel her actions are worth a promotion? She is used pursuing legal action against my wife because she is trying to protect the contents of Commissioner Merseglia's second unpublished county taxpayer provided emails. Why do you have an unpublished email address for certain people and not for the taxpayers? And in one month, that email through a certification in Bucks County said that there were 10,000 emails to this secret email address. That's more than 300 every day for a month. And you've had since February to provide one of them. How many other people have a double secret public email? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Megan Brock. I'll be commenting on item 3A. Oh, sorry, I'll be commenting on item 3A. It's nice to see everyone again. I know it's been a couple, couple of months. Last week, I received two emails from Ashley Dayu, who is in the agenda, informing me that Bucks County had filed not one, but two lawsuits against me. On February 7th and March 8th of this year, I filed three public records requests with Bucks County seeking records about why Bucks County abruptly changed its school health and safety guidance this past August. After the county uh, failed to properly respond to my request, I filed two appeals with the Office of Open Records, the governing body of public record requests in Pennsylvania. I won both appeals, and the county was ordered to produce the records in 30 days. However, instead of producing the records, Bucks County filed two lawsuits against me, seeking to overturn the appeals and keep the records hidden. Your actions have left me with many questions. First, what are you hiding? What are you hiding? What do these records contain that you don't want the public, some of who are here, to see? Second, how many thousands of dollars is the county wasting by suing Jamie and I to avoid transparency? That's four lawsuits just between the two of us. That's a lot of legal fees. Will you be able to tell us how much money the county has already spent, and then how much are you willing to spend? Because what's gonna happen is we're in the court of common pleas, and if Jamie and I win, they may then take it to Commonwealth Court. And if we win there, they may take it to the Supreme Court. I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars during a time where many people in Bucks County are facing financial hardship. Do you really think that's an appropriate use of taxpayer dollars to sue two soccer moms to prevent yourselves from having to hand over emails a governing agency in Pennsylvania ordered you to make public. The county has put me in a position where I'm now faced with spending thousands of dollars in legal fees at great personal cost, or I can represent myself. I called the Bucks County Office of Prothonotary and was graciously told that if I choose to represent myself, I'll have free access to the Bucks County Legal Library. Thank goodness you finally unblocked my phone number and I was able to call that office and take advantage of this tremendous resource while you use my tax money to sue me to withhold pep public records. Did me a solid. It's not a fair fight. You know it's not a fair fight. That's probably why you're doing it. As, uh, which is amazing given the bullying and intimidation tactics Jamie and I have faced from you over the past 10 months. We've been, as we've spoken, we've been referred to as angry, liars, conspiracy theorists, have told we can't attend public meetings. And all we've done is come and ask questions and give two-minute public comments. 
All we wanted was a truth. We just want to know why children were prevented from having an education. That's all. I wanted to play a comment that Commissioner Marsegli made on the January 5th meeting that, in my opinion, ends with threatening language. County from being discredited, from people who come in here and lie, from people who make up things and say them because I can't have the people of Bucks County hear lies and lies and lies because eventually they'll start to think that they're true. So a general caution to everyone out there, when you hear people that are saying or posting on Facebook and other social media, things that seem incredulous, don't believe it. There's more to it. If you have a question, and it has to do with the county, we're happy to ask about that. When people do that, it is morally wrong, it is ethically wrong, and it is Bucks County wrong. But I am going to start to knock them down, because even though people have advised us, just ignore them, just ignore them when they lie, I'm not going to do that because of what happened in Washington. I'm going to start to knock them down. I'm going to start to knock them down. In the next meeting, um, Commissioner Marsegli actually specifically called out Ms. Walker by name. So I think it's very safe to assume that was talking to us. Is this what you meant by I'm going to knock them down? By filing frivolous lawsuits? By trying to drain me of my personal resources? By trying to make me choose if I'm going to fight for transparency in our county or save them for my child's education fund? This is ethically wrong, it's morally wrong, and it's Bucks County wrong. Vanna Darmond. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, I'm here to talk about the item 3A on the agenda regarding the agency open records officers. For those of us who don't know, but by now we do, Commissioners, you are suing Jamie Walker and Megan Brock because you do not want to provide emails that were legally awarded to them by the Office of Open Records of Pennsylvania. Now that you are hiring a new um, agency open uh, records officer, will you be using our taxpaying dollars to have the officer and others you appoint to provide the many emails that have been awarded? And will you stop using our taxpayer dollars to avoid following the law? How do we taxpayers find out how many of our dollars have been used for these officers and how much are you spending on legal fees? I think we deserve to know where we learn that information. Why have we gone through so many uh, open um, records agency officers? As, as someone else said, three in 11 months? That's quite a lot. I'm definitely questioning the use of our money in regards to following the Sunshine Act, which I believe you don't want to follow. As you know, we just celebrated our independence from tyranny. The Sunshine Act was passed because it provides a way for citizens to know how our officials are governing. Why does it feel like we are being ruled and are under tyranny for the past two years? You once said or wrote, heavy is the head that wears the crown, but you don't wear a crown. None of you do. You are elected by we the people. You are beholden to us. So with that said, how are these new officers being trained? Are they being told to deny all right to know requests? Is it sort of like a standard process, deny, 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 make us have to appeal? At this point, how can we taxpayers trust you on anything? So much has been brought into the light, and you are trying to hide things from the light. I urge you to come clean, do the right thing. This isn't about politics. This is about what's right. Thank you. Connor Albright. Hello. 
Hello, I'm Connor Albright. I'm from Doylestown Township. I'm aware that right to know requests made seeking documents from August of last year. These requests have been granted by the proper authorities, but now they're being withheld for unknown reasons. The denial has been turned into a lawsuit against two outspoken local moms. Right to know requests allow for transparency in our government. And suppressing or omitting documents in these requests does nothing more than shrink public confidence in our institutions. As a concerned citizen of this community, it is of paramount importance that we make sure transparency with our government is preserved. The confidence and power we have granted to our officials must be used for the benefit of our community at large and not to suppress information from outspoken individuals doing due diligence on those wielding the powers that we have granted. I hope that these issues resolve quickly and painlessly to preserve the confidence that I and many of our community have placed in our institutions. Unfortunately, this confidence that we placed has been slowly eroding due to this issue. I have only been made aware of this a couple days ago, and I believe that the public is not going to let this go as long as you continue to withhold right to no request information. Thank you. Josh Hogan. All right, good morning, commissioners. Um, item 3A, appointment of new open records officers. In particular, Ashley Dayub, I apologize if I'm getting your name wrong, Ashley, um, who will be working the right to know requests for you guys and for what happened last August. I want to address basically a couple of, I think, simple but salient points about the situation that she's coming into. First of all, all these folks who you're about to appoint to these positions, I think they deserve congratulations. Congratulations to everybody for this. Obviously, they're coming into a bases loaded jam, right? This is a hot situation. I want to personally give a big shout out to Jamie Walker and Megan Brock for the situation we're in because they are highlighting something that I think is very important, and I'm going to get to why. Leadership from, in particular, the chair of the Board of Commissioners, but all three of you, is critical, right, to the good, healthy functioning of the county. Last August, Megan brought up the great point outside at the press conference. This all happened because bad things happened to kids. And specifically, people in this room did bad things to kids. I'm not pointing at Dr. Damsky. I want to be clear about that. People in this room did bad things to kids. We want to find out why and make sure that we can stop it. Now you're throwing up every roadblock imaginable, and there's a couple of salient points in this current strategy of we're just going to take people to court, bleed them of money, use taxpayer resources that I want to call out. First of all, the specific issue against Megan Brock that Mrs. Dayub is coming into, okay, you, I don't know where she is, but you are coming into this situation where you are going to be responsible for a lawsuit in common pleas on the issue of specificity. What is that? I don't know if you guys even know about this. Mr. Khan, the solicitor, might not as well. The specific issue at hand in Jamie Walker's cases is, is can a citizen request all emails from one email address for the course of a month? And the Commonwealth Court has already decided this. In fact, the Supreme Court has affirmed it. Yes, it's perfectly fine and reasonable. And the reason that I think it's important to make this point, that you guys are essentially asking the entire state to overturn that precedence, to set new precedents that would come from Bucks County, reducing transparency in the whole state. Okay? You would essentially increase the threshold of specificity that's required for people to get records. Reducing transparency for 12.5 million people in the state of Pennsylvania, every governmental agency in the entire state. That's not a good look for Pennsylvania. I don't, I don't want to be a part of like the county dynamic that causes that. The other issue, and this is a little bit more near and dear to my heart, is you know, leadership of people and what happens to your leaders and followers when you make bad decisions, when you guide them into the wrong place, right? We had this crazy thing called reopen box, and we had to do all kinds. We, we marched into stores without masks on when you weren't supposed to do that. That's putting people in a tough position. It's hard as a leader in that situation to put people in those positions. I want to ask you, what position do you think you are putting your supporters and followers in? Okay, we have people right now, like Democrats, probably a lot of people in this room, folks watching the feed, hi folks on Facebook, 
who are Democrat, who, are, who support Commissioner Marsegla, Commissioner Harvey. They're on your team, they want to be. Think about what you're doing to their psyche right now. They have to adopt, just by virtue of the tribal aspect of the way people are, they have to adopt a position of saying, I like what the commissioners are doing, because I don't like that Megan Brock, I don't like Jamie Walker, I don't like that Josh Hogan. We want to just keep them out so they can't figure stuff out. So I'm okay with all of this nonsense that's being done, right? Spending taxpayer money, blocking people from receiving records. That is a bad position to put people in. It's bad leadership. So given those two things, I'm gonna go back to what I said to start, you know, congratulations to the folks who are coming in. I wanna believe that any time a leaf turns over, it's an opportunity for change. Let's hope that these po folks that you're about to appoint to these positions are gonna make decisions that are interest in the interests of the people and transparency. Thanks. Okay, addressing some of the questions, I'll turn to Mr. Khan on some of these. So Mr. Khan, in terms of having a, a couple different open records officers over the past couple months, I uh, just want to explain some of that and, and Ashley Dayoub's role specifically. Sure, and um, Commissioner, maybe in answering that I can speak to the question about the, um, the longer historical arc of the, the yeah. volume here, um, which Patricia was, was brought up. Is your um, microphone on? Mic's off. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, thank you. Um, so by way of background, uh, the county, when um, it was first required to designate somebody to handle incoming requests that were um, submitted under the right to know law, this was um, just under 10 years ago, um, the volume was relatively small. Um, the county had one person who ultimately reported to the commissioners handling all of those requests. Um, and what we ended up seeing um, gradually, um, but, but steadily, um, was an increase in the volume um, at what has, over the last couple of years, um, basically been roughly a doubling of the volume year by year. Um, and so um, when we try to get our, head, our heads around um, the most efficient way for the county to deal with these requests to ensure that we get the public uh, everything they're entitled to and that we um, do that uh, in the appropriate way, abiding by all of the laws, um, including um, the numerous um, exemptions um, that bind um, uh, uh, counties and public agencies from releasing privileged and protected information. Um, we looked at other uh, large counties um, to see how they were doing things. Um, in particular, um, Philadelphia and Allegheny um, had gotten to the point where they had um, essentially siloed their right to know operations, um, uh, both with respect to the row officers and certainly in the case of Philadelphia, down to each department inside of the city. Um, at the time that we came to that decision, this was back in around 2020, um, we noted that in, um, I think it was calendar year 2015, there had been a total of 40 right to know productions countywide, uh, and that year there were 40 right to know productions just from row officers um, alone. And we also um, began to become aware of some of the, the um, tensions, balance, uh, checks and balances issues, conflicts issues that could arise between the commissioners and row officers or between row officers. Um, and so um, about a year ago, um, the county rolled out a, um, a variation on its model, um, which was to not have designated right to know officers for each department uh, reporting to the commissioners, but to specifically um, uh, empower the row officers to select um, either a member of their staff um, or uh, if they wish to have their solicitor um, play that role, um, they could do that. And, um, and, and so that, that uh, took effect uh, last year and uh, at that point the, um, uh, the county had designated um, uh, one individual to um, oversee all the commissioner's um, work um, and uh, you know, as is the case in county government, uh, people people uh, come and go. Um, uh, the original right to know officer under these commissioners um, uh, moved to another department. Um, the person who most recently ser served in that role um, left county employment um, to go into a, a different field. Um, and so um, when that happened, I think there was also a question about the timing. Um, th th these positions have not been vacant, um, uh, or no positions have been vacant. Um, the, um, the commissioner's um, open records officer, um, her, her last day was on Friday, um, and so uh, this would take effect uh, retroactive to July 1, um, but yesterday was the first business day that we've had um, since, um, since Robbie Kane's departure. Um, so that's by way, in terms of the, the overview, um, and I wanna make sure I get back to your question. Can you remind me, Commissioner, what 
specifically you want me to, to, to touch on? I think that was one, one of the things was uh, the having a declared open records officer, you know, changes and, and, and explaining the changes why. Um, I talked about volume a little bit in terms of how that's changed over the recently, the last two years especially. Yeah, that, and, and that's true. Um, and, and I want to, there were a number of uh, comments that were made about um, specific litigation, which we generally would, would frown upon commenting on. I also want to ask, is, is J. Chadwick Schnee here? Okay, so um, one of the ethical um, requirements, commissioners, is that um, attorneys should not be speaking with uh, represented parties uh, without their attorneys present. Um, there were two individuals um, that were being described as uh, being sued by the county, which I can also also address. Um, I don't think that's a, 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 um, a helpful characterization. Um, but those two individuals, plus a third gentleman, um, for some time uh, have informed us that they are jointly represented by the same legal counsel, Mr. Schnee, who's been representing him in a bunch of these matters. Um, and so as the volume of rights and no request has, has really skyrocketed um, to the a point where we're now probably getting between a dozen and 20 every week um, just for um, the department's reporting to the commissioners. Um, uh, similarly, we've seen an increase in, uh, in the number of appeals that are taken. And um, the, um, what I think probably very few people have an understanding of is the process through which this works. Um, a request comes to the county. Um, the uh, county or whatever agency is reviewing it has to make sure that that request is reviewed appropriately. Um, and when that is done, a determination is made. If the person who makes the request does not like the outcome, um, that person can then um, file what's called an appeal, but it doesn't go to a judge or a court, it goes to an agency. Um, uh, it's called the Office of Open Records and it's based in Harrisburg. Um, contrary to what I think was suggested by one of the commenters, that is not the final stop in the process. Um, if either party um, disagrees with the decision that the Office of Open Records makes in a specific case, and I'm just speaking generally, um, then the next step of review is not um, Office of Open Records appeals, um, it actually goes to a local court of common pleas. Um, and that's, that is the process that happens. Um, so it's, it's the next level of appeal, and that can happen um, at the request of either party. That could be the, the case of, in the case of the agency. The agency, uh, in this case the county, um, can request an appeal of a determination it doesn't agree with, uh, or the requester can, can do that. And that has happened um, uh, uh, with respect to both requesters and with respect to uh, the county. Um, and when, when we talk about the increase, um, I took notes on, on some of the comments. Um, with respect to um, the increase in appeals, um, uh, the, the, the math works out to 73% of the appeals that we have um, pending right now uh, or that have been filed um, in the last five or six months have been just from those three people represented by Mr. Schnee. Um, so other than, than those three individuals, um, the, the, the overall number of appeals has not gone up that dramatically. Um, but, but a very small group of people um, have, have dramatically increased those overall numbers. Um, do you want me to also explain a little bit about what we mean by a, a, a review or a lawsuit? Do you want me to talk yeah. about that? Please. So um, uh, the county certainly has, um, uh, at, at, uh, very proudly under the leadership of this administration, um, built an affirmative litigation program. We've actually worked really well with our district attorney, uh, who we're really happy to, to, to have here with us. We have teamed up uh, uh, in going after uh, bad actors, um, such as uh, the manufacturers of foam that had dangerous PFAS uh, chemicals, which present a health risk to all people in Bucks County. Uh, we both um, uh, took action against opioid manufacturers and distributors and worked collaboratively in finding the best way to make that recovery um, serve the people of Bucks County. Um, what we have not done is going, going after individual residents of Bucks County, suing them for uh, damages or trying to force them to do things. Um, if, you, if you just go to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, of Pennsylvania's um, uh, website, you can look at what the civil cover sheet for anything that you file in court looks like. And there's a whole bunch of boxes you can check that indicate what kind of action uh, might be um, um, being uh, put into court. 
Um, and you'll see the kinds of things that we're talking about, these tort actions, these negligence actions, these public nuisance um, actions. You can indicate whether you're, you're seeking damages, you're trying to force people to do things. When we talk about this right to know um, uh, appeal process, when it moves from the Office of Open Records and for the first time goes into a court of law and that process gets started, um, if you look on that uh, cover sheet, you will see um, there's a box for civil appeals and there's a box uh, under there for statutory appeal. And that's the box that you would see, and I'm just speaking generally, in any of these cases where um, a, 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 a petition for review, um, which is exactly what it says um, in these filings, um, is presented. Um, uh, right at the top on the docket um, and in the, in the header of every, um, everything that's filed in these cases, um, you will see um, the words civil action, appeal from state agency. Um, and anyone who's ever been sued, and unfortunately that includes everyone sitting up here, I think all the elected officials um, that are in this room um, in the last two and a half years, unfortunately have been sued for damages or have been sued um, uh, for injunctive relief in, in really frivolous cases that, that have been dismissed or, or being worked through in the courts. Um, but in every one of these cases where money is sought or action is sought, that is spelled out in the complaint that's filed at the end. It's called the, um, the prayer for relief or the relief sought. Um, but in each of these cases, um, when review is sought by the court of the open records uh, office's determination, the relief sought doesn't seek anything um, from the other party. What it simply says is it, it, it seeks a reversal of the office of open records determination and then a declaration um, that the agency, in this case the county, doesn't have to do anything different. Um, and again, I don't know, Commissioner, if you want me to speak more to, to some, of the, some of the laws that are, are at play here or the nature of some of these, these kinds of requests that have been discussed. I think one of the, issue, one of the questions that was raised was about um, right to know requests increasing. But prior to 2020, um, how many requests were there, right to know requests for emails of commissioners? Um, to my knowledge, there were none. Okay, none. Okay. Um, just over the past, since like November, um, for the three people you mentioned or, or referenced, how many submissions have we had for right to know requests? Um, I, I'm going to make sure I was jotting notes down and I, I Assuming what, what I have is correct, it looks like it's 111 um, during that time period. 111 right to know requests made um, since November. From, from those three individuals represented by Mr. Schnee. So in eight months, roughly one every two days. Um, so, so, okay. Um, I think it's also, um, I don't think we've kind of spent enough time on that actually. Um, yeah, just to reference a couple of the things that were mentioned in terms of emails uh, and having two different email addresses, that's actually pretty common practice among uh, elected officials. Um, it was like that when I was elected here. There is a public-facing email which is available on uh, the website, and there's also an internal email which is used among um, you know, the, the staff here as well as elected officials. Which everyone has. Which everyone has, and that was true even before I was elected. And I don't know if it was true when... Those, but I did not, but everybody has always had that. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, in terms of looking at some of the other issues, there's a question from Mr. Warren about... I remember one. Um, Mr. Warren asked about Appendix F. Um, that is actually referencing is a, a, the state made a change in January regarding the pay rate uh, for, um, for that kind of work. And so we're having to adjust our, our contracts to reflect that change at the state. Um, also asked, what's the other? Is there something else you asked about, Mr. Warren? I circled it. Oh, the no longer bound. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on or, or question what the reasoning was for, there was a, I think it was just a mis, it was miswritten, I think, in the original um, agenda last month or last, or last meeting. Ms. Neff, if you want to talk about that. Thank you. Yes, um, the 9A is just amending it because it was on the prior agenda as a premium pay contract, and it should have been a project-related contract, um, and that's just reflecting the update. Yeah, so, so it was doesn't change the amounts, not double amounts, the same amount, it's just clarifying what the, what the, what the actual work is. 
and the work for Workforce development, um, we're actually going to have hear a little bit about that later on um, from a young lady who's sitting behind you. She's going to come and make a presentation about that. Uh, that's something we're excited about. We think that's going to make um, a lot of difference in trying to help people get back to, get back to work and getting those kind of jobs they need. Um, Yeah, that's what I was that's what I was referencing the, the the vehicle for training. We're gonna we're gonna have a presentation we're gonna have a presentation about that under regular agenda. So in about like five five ten minutes, okay, which I think will answer your questions. Okay. All right. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Oh, oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Just, just comment. Um, and because I, I really think this. This is an important issue that we're talking about. Um, the right to know requests and the Office of Open Records. Um, and I, I know the comment was made that I've been silent, and I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, back in 2019, when I ran for county commissioner, first ran after 25 years in the legislature. I uh, remember going around, knocking on doors, and there were a lot of comments where, you know, who are the county commissioners and what do they do? Uh, and boy, did that change in 2020 uh, because of the COVID. I remember being across the street at Republican headquarters on election night in 2019. Watching the returns come in, and I was the only Republican that won. All the other incumbent Republicans were defeated the incumbent commissioner who I was running with, Rob Lockery, uh, lost the election. Uh, it was kind of just almost devastating being in that room. Uh, I never could have imagined winning an election could feel so bad. But after a few weeks went by, getting over the disappointment, I realized, and again, I had been an elected official for 25 years, I realized that we have to govern. The people had spoken. They elected people not of my party. And I was in a position other than the district attorney who had been there for two years of being the only elected Republican. So I realized that we had to get together and govern. That's what the people of Buck County would expect it from us. Now, I was up in Harrisburg when we put together this right to know law and open records office together. And, and boy, that was a really, really difficult issue to try to come to an agreement on. There were people, and it wasn't actually a, a Democrat or a Republican thing. There were actually people on both sides of the aisle who thought we just wanted to o open up everything to everybody, no matter what it was, and, and that's just the way it was going to be. And then there were people, Democrats and Republicans on the other side, who didn't want to give very little or didn't, didn't want to do very much when it came to open records. And I was kind of like, it wasn't, I wasn't the sponsor of the bill. I, I was kind of like, I worked behind the scenes a little bit, trying to figure out how do we compromise on this, on right to know, and open records. And I, and I think the law as it is now, I think we did a pretty good job. And, and I say this because being in the rooms when we were negotiating 
the final bill, kind of like both sides didn't have a, a happy look on their face, so everybody was trying to give and compromise to come up with a bill. And again, I thought it was really important that the, the public have access to records, emails, texts, you know, whatever it is. The, it was the, the, the newspaper association that was very heavily involved in it as well. Uh, different groups and organizations were as well. They wanted access to different things. So, I, you know, I, I, I thought we came up with a pretty good bill. A and, and it seems to me that it's been working pretty well, not only here in Bucks, but, uh, but around the state. Um, I got an email from Jamie, I think yesterday or the day before, and inviting me to the press conference today outside. Um, and at, at the end, end of the email, I, I, I don't know, I'm just gonna paraphrase something like, you know, if you, if you, if, if you remain silent, you're not supporting open records. And so that, that's why I, I very much wanted to speak. And you have a right, according to the law, to put in requests for open records. And there is a process, and I know Joe explained it, I think, pretty well of going to the Office of Open Records. You have a right, whether you, whether you file one right to know request or 101 right to know request. You have a right to do that under the law. But at the law, as we put it together, there also is, I don't know, call it a suit, a lawsuit, or you know, an appeal, whether you're the requester or the entity who's being requested that you can file an appeal, and, I, and and again, I didn't look at the law, but you know, as you, as you go, it goes to the Court of Common Pleas, maybe, and then maybe to Commonwealth Court, one of the, and then you can even take it to the Supreme Court. So that that gives the people on both sides the ability to appeal for whatever reasons. And again, when we put that all together, these exemptions and restrictions, that was really a point of contention of how this this was going to work. So. I agree with you, you have every right to file these requests. But there also is an appeal process. There's an appeal process for you as well as the entity where you're filing the request. And, and, and just, just in closing, Josh, I know you wrote a, an op-ed, um, I think it was in the paper last week, I think, I believe. Uh, you mentioned uh, an awful lot of names of presidents that you mentioned that were I guess, as it relates to the Office of Open Records. I, I, I don't think you mentioned Ronald Reagan, um, who kind of was one of my favorite presidents growing up. Um, and, and at the time Ronald Reagan was president, there was a gentleman from Massachusetts. His name was uh, Tip O'Neill. And Ronald Reagan was kind of like the the conservative and Tip O'Neill was kind of like the, the liberal lion from Massachusetts who was Speaker of the House. And they would, and at, at the, the stories they both told, they would fight during the day on issues and bills and what was right and what was wrong. But at night, Tip O'Neill would kind of like in secrecy slide over to the White House and him and Ronald Reagan would talk about what was going on and about issues, and they would have a couple drinks together. And they got an awful lot accomplished. They accomplished an awful lot. Ronald Reagan expanded Medicaid, and a lot of people call Medicaid medical assistance, Ronald Reagan expanded Medicaid three times during his presidency. The last time this country has passed comprehensive immigration reform, Ronald Reagan signed a bill that created that immigration reform. It was the end of the Iron Curtain in Europe and Russia under Ronald Reagan, and Tip O'Neill had a lot to do with that. 
So it, just kind of getting to the point that we, we can work together. I know Josh and Megan and Jamie, we had talked maybe a year ago, not maybe not quite nine months ago, about trying to get together and set up meetings to talk about these issues. And I'm not gonna blame anybody for why it didn't happen. I mean, it, it just it just didn't happen. We just couldn't get together and put the, the meeting together. And hey, frankly, I'm, I'm still hopeful that at some point that we can get together and work on these things. I mean, it's democracy at work. I mean, we might have disagreements on some things. Me and the other two commissioners, I mean, we haven't always gotten along. We've had disagreements. Sometimes they spilled out into the public, not often, because I thought we tried to be very respectful when we disagreed and tried to find compromise. So I wish we could do that now. I mean, um, so anyway, I, I just thought maybe I fumbled this a little bit and maybe talked too long, but uh, I just wanted to get them comments on the record. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, gonna move on to our consent agenda. Um, the minutes from June 15th meeting, are there any comments or corrections, suggestions about the minutes? Nods or a motion to approve the minutes as presented. Oh, we'll do that. Yeah, we'll do that first. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, resolutions on the consent agenda one through 16. Um, is there a motion to approve those resolutions? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. All right, regular agenda. Item number 17 is housing community development. Um, if we have... We have regular. We have regular coming up. The re, that's regular. Okay. That's later. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Sorry yes. Yeah. Um, Lars. Where's oh she is. Oh okay. <laughs> I was looking for Jeff Fields. You don't look like Jeff Fields. Good morning. So morning. Just, just a little bit of history on the street medicine. Uh, street medicine began as a movement that came into existence in the 1990s when Jen Withers with Mercy Hospital of Pittsburgh started a program. Turn up that. Is it better? Yes. Thank you. Right. Sorry about that. That's all right. Uh, it came into existence in the 1990s when Jim Withers with Mercy Hospital in Pittsburgh started a program that met directly with clients to address their health barriers. He and his team found that many individuals experiencing homelessness had a variety of unmet physical and behavioral health needs that negatively impacted their ability uh, in, to tr successfully transition to permanent housing and their quality of life. The Department of Housing and Community Development serves as the lead agency for the housing link, or the Bucks County Continuum of Care, and is responsible for setting the policy and seeking new sources for funding for homeless services in the county. At any given time, there are about 100 individuals who are unsheltered and hundreds more who are residing in transient situations and at risk for homelessness. For those who are unsheltered, there are dedicated teams of street outreach providers who work with individuals to get them connected to services and resources that can help end their episodes of homelessness. Street outreach providers have been sharing more and more feedback that some of the barriers that the un unsheltered face are beyond their level of expertise and care. Challenges including physical health, mental health, and substance use. In the last 12 months, 58% of unsheltered individuals enrolled with street outreach teams reported having a chronic health condition, and 44% reporting having a physical disability. These barriers were exacerbated with the COVID-19 pandemic, which has disproportionately impacted the unsheltered population, whose prior health conditions make them at a greater risk of negative outcomes from COVID-19. The vulnerability of this unsheltered population is further demonstrated by recent release of national data and findings by the California Policy Lab that found individuals experiencing homelessness are at four times more likely to report a physical health condition, one and a half times more likely to report a mental health condition, and five times more likely to report a substance use condition. To address this gap, the Department of Housing and Community Development began working with Family Service Association around developing a pilot program for street medicine in Bucks County. 
This was made possible due to additional funding received by the department for COVID to address COVID impact in the county. The idea was for a street outreach team with specialized skill sets to address these unmet needs of those living on shelter. The program's primary program, the program's primary goals are to improve the health outcomes for those experiencing unsheltered homelessness, to remove barriers to healthcare services, and to support appropriate use of emergency, inpatient, and crisis health services. Success in these programs goals is anticipated to improve the ability for clients to move into stable permanent housing and to retain long-term housing. The street medicine outreach team is modeled to consist of a certified recovery specialist, a certified registered nurse, a registered nurse, and a physician. These staff will jointly work with existing street outreach teams and other homeless service programs within the county. In addition to regular outreach, the provision of clinical services, and connecting clients to mainstream health services, the street medicine team will also provide acute care, which is includes but is not limited to small wound care, respiratory treatment, preventative care, which has a focus on simple interventions, and at quarterly community clinics to promote early detection for a wide range of diseases. This pilot program launched uh, several months ago, and we're excited that it has already started to receive support with other sources, such as Keystone First. Street Medicine is a unique initiative that HCD is happy to be launching for our nonprofit providers, and we look forward to sharing outcomes as the program progresses over time. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, I also have workforce and economic development, um, Farber Specialty Vehicles, Diana Crowley's here. Good morning. Good morning. Or afternoon, almost. <laughs> uh, thank you for inviting me to talk about our Workforce on Wheels, and thank you to Mr. Warren for your interesting question. Um, we are requesting uh, just under a uh, purchase of just under $400,000 for a mobile uh, workforce on wheels unit. Um, the services that this unit will be able to bring across the county will be the services that are offered in our PA Career Link centers in uh, Bristol and in Percocy. If you've driven through the county, you know that it's a long haul to get to either one of those sites. So we're looking forward to bringing uh, our mobile unit to serve more individuals in their community. Uh, this will allow us to do workshops, including uh, registration on the state job search site, interview workshops, resume writing, everything we do in our regular career length will be scaled down in a mobile unit and brought to um, schools, libraries, community events, uh, anywhere that we're invited to go, we hope to be there. Um, the vehicle will have Wi-Fi, computers, it will be staffed, it'll be a small meeting room area as well. Uh, and this will be a custom-built RV, uh, probably about a dozen seats uh, for participants to use. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any other questions? No? No? Okay. No, I think it's obviously, like you said, we have the PA career link, which a lot of people hopefully you're aware of, uh, you know, in, in terms of being able to go there, being able to get connected to job opportunities, being able to improve their skills and, and, and learn new things, get help writing resumes, get help with interview uh, techniques. Um, but, but as you said, this allows all of that to get to people who may not be able to get to those other places. And of course, all the services are free, right. um, which I should always mention the first sentence. <laughs> yeah. So. So yeah, it's free to the people who want to go and, and want to look for that help and get that help. And it's obviously we're, we're thrilled to be able to offer that to them. Okay, so, okay, thank, thank you. you, appreciate it. Okay. Um, all right, so in addition to looking at these uh, projects, obviously the, um, the item 17, which is the street medicine, um, really that's something, you know, combined with, um, one of the other agenda items is we're spending um, with this agenda that we're approving uh, with these items um, about $297,000 to address the homeless problem in Bucks County um, with workforce economic development. You know, we're looking at uh, not just the $400,000, um, but also um, almost another $50,000 on training to help uh, people do on the job training and learn more skills. Uh, there's $73,000 going to victims of domestic violence and helping them. Um, about uh, $223,000 uh, 
uh, is going to help our senior citizens, um, in making sure they can stay in their homes and find housing, um, as well as rehabilita rehabilitation services for uh, those in Shemi Manor, and about $250,000 going to um, children and adults who suffer from some intellectual disabilities or physical disabilities to help them uh, and their families. Um, Okay, looking at the regular agenda, if there are no questions about the regular agenda, is there a motion to approve items 17 and 18? So, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Budget adjustments, Mr. Boscola. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Um, budget adjustment number 82 is the final for the 2021 calendar year um, to adjust the COVID, um, the CARES money, and to close out the 21 um, audit. Um, Adjustments three through seven are five adjustments correcting or adjusting the carry forward of capital project funds um, from 21 to 22 per the um, annual financial report. Um, what I do in the budget is to estimate what the carry forward of the capital project funds are going to be. This is the adjusting them to the correct amounts. Um, None of the six adjustments have any effect on either the 21 or the 22 ending fund balance. Okay. Any comments or questions for Mr. Boscola? No? Okay. Um, is there a motion to approve the budget adjustments as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> okay. Board appointments. We have. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Personnel. Personnel actions at the bottom. Any um, comments or questions? If not, is there a motion to approve the personnel actions? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Yeah. Board appointments, we have two. Uh, Mr. Jay Depler is being reappointed to the Juvenile Detention Center Board of Managers. His term will end um, July 1st, 2025. Uh, Mr. James Prokopiak is being appointed to the Bucks County Redevelopment Authority. His term will end July 17th, 2027. Is there a motion to appoint those two gentlemen? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, other civics, we have two contributions, $3,000 to foundations at the manor, $2,000 to Last Chance Ranch. Is there a motion to authorize those contributions? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Chief Operating Officer, Ms. McKevitt. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, a couple of, of updates and reminders. The uh, Household Hazardous Waste Collection Program is August 13th. And this time it is in Lower Bucks County at the Ben Salem High School. Uh, and you don't have to register online any longer. You can just show up and bring your items along. There is a WED Talk scheduled. And this is Workforce and Economic Development's new program where they invite speakers to come. And it is virtual. Uh, this, this WED Talk is scheduled for July 13th. It's coming up very quickly. It is called Changing I Quit to I Fit to Increase Employee Retention. And I think it'll be a, a timely topic. The speaker is Heather Younger. Uh, she is a best-selling author and CEO of Employee Fanatics. And we, we look forward to, to joining her in this web talk. And, and it will be, you can register online on the county's website. And another reminder out to folks who own businesses. Uh, the county is updating its comprehensive plan. It is the Bucks 2040 uh, comprehensive plan, and there's a business survey that is hosted on the county's website. We really like it if you could go in, take the survey, um, so that it can help us inform the comprehensive plan uh, goals and objectives. Uh, it will be open for probably for the next at least six months. So if you could get out there, businesses, and 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 uh, fill out the survey, we would very much appreciate it. And then also, Commissioner, we are. Uh, monitoring the state's budget cycle and hoping that they will resolve it quickly so that we can determine what the impacts will be. I know Rachel's anxiously waiting to see what they what it will be and how it will impact our human services budget as well. And that concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Kahn. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I'll begin by reporting that the board had its standing executive session, which it um, typically holds the day before the public meeting. Uh, they conducted that with staff and legal counsel to discuss personnel and employment matters, emergency preparedness, and real estate matters, collective bargaining, and pending litigation. 
Um, finally, I'd like to, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to really share an update about the county's continued efforts to reduce the cost of doing business while doing so in, an, in a more environmentally friendly way. Um, so for many years, um, the only way that members of the public um, could find out what was actually happening at these meetings was to drive uh, or come over uh, to the administration building in Doylestown. Um, and if they couldn't do that and they wanted to uh, read about what happened, um, they would have to come to the building and actually uh, review the minutes, which were in a uh, very ornate minutes book. Um, and they'd have to uh, do that also for county ordinances, which are the laws that the commissioners pass um, that are specific to Bucks County. Um, and all of that would have to be done by appointment during regular business hours. Um, some years ago, the county did begin um, posting online uh, the minutes, as well as audio recording, uh, recordings of the meetings. And um, as most folks know, it was under this administration um, that access was dramatically expanded so that everyone anywhere could watch meetings which were being live streamed in real time. Um, we also went through and we scanned the 60 some years of ordinances, posted them online for the first time so folks would never have to make an appointment to find out what the law was in Bucks County. Um, and we continued that tradition of um, printing the minutes out and binding them in these, um, and I, I brought the most recent one, these beautiful um, leather bound books. Um, and uh, we've continued that um, uh, under the, the current administration. Um, the minutes are now signed by the secretary, a position uh, that was newly created, um, currently occupied by Commissioner Di Girolamo. And after he signs the minutes, we, we continue to put them in the book. The book is about to fill up. And um, following the uh, regular course of business, we'd be spending almost $500 to buy another one. Um, but we are gonna take the opportunity now to um, have another paperless innovation of making our, the county's official book um, purely electronic. Um, in the two and a half years that I've been here, um, no one has ever requested to review the leather books with the minutes inside since they're online. But of course, if anyone ever wants to do that, they're still welcome to come down and marvel at them. Um, but for future minutes uh, moving forward, um, we will exclusively put them in the electronic book, um, which is, as we said at the beginning, um, not just uh, cost, uh, more cost effective, um, but also better for the environment. That completes my report. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right, we'll move to brief public comments uh, on general items. Uh, Nancy Sherlock. Good afternoon, Nancy Sherlock from Marsville. Um, uh, sitting here for these last couple hours, um, my agenda sort of has changed totally. But, uh, but my comments, um, I can't speak to the press conference, I did not attend. Um, but, and I don't have enough information to, to say what's going on, but I will say, as your attorney has said very eloquently, he explained the right to know process. And uh, frivolous right to knows are very costly. Uh, when you, when, when the, 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 right, the right to knows have to be reviewed by your attorney, they, some things may re, be redacted, and when you have uh, an appeal, that is not a lawsuit, as your attorney has said. So. I just wanted to comment on that. Um, so, um, what I would say is there are many people across this county, right? Not many, there are a number of people in the county and not only the county, but the country who have chosen to board what I call the crazy train of conspiracies and denial, which includes the 2020 election. For those of you who are concerned about the CRT and the indoctrination of your children and the possibility of turning them gay, please find another hobby that makes sense. No one is forcing your child to pick a gender. And I hear no masks, no vaccines, my body, my choice. Well, I'm asking that you remember that slogan when you discuss Roe v. Wade. Um, so, for, in particular, the two women and, and the gentlemen that were here at, this, uh, at the dais, um, many are supporting them, but I wanted to know if they've ever been an educator or have had a family member who was an educator. Do they even know what the position entails, what that profession entails? And if you don't care for the teaching of real science... Oh, sorry. Yeah, your time's up. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Priscilla Linden. Who ranted we can't. On politically and personally. All right. We can't hear you. Sorry. So this is my statement of Priscilla Linden from Upper Makefield Township. It is time to stop. It is time for Jamie Walker and Megan Brock to end their personal political vendetta against the Bucks County commissioners and their individual singling out of Commissioner Marseglia. They are continually interrupting the people's business. The answer to their original question, almost a year ago now, was given to them promptly at that time. That is, the reason for reimposing mass requirements last fall was because Bucks County COVID-19 rates were spiking up. So it was healthy to wear the mask until that was put down. They did not like that answer. So almost every meeting since, they have turned their protest into a ad hominem attack on Commissioner Marseglia. Stop it. We, the people, are sick of it. It's time to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Andy Warren. I realize more than any that no appointment to a county board is for life. And that as a majority winner in a county election, a commissioner needs no more justification for a board appointment other than to callously state, because I said so. I know all that. But I ask how self-proclaimed board openness and fairness equates to the last week's non-appointment of Dave Breidinger to the Board of Trustees. His non-appointment can't be based on length of service. Mr. Breidinger has served one term. Comparatively, there is at least one member on the Board of Trustees, a very productive member, I might add, that I appointed 30 years ago. So length of service isn't a criteria. It can't be because he doesn't carry his weight as a board member. Mr. Breidinger was so respected by fellow board members, he was elected chairman. And in that capacity, he led a successful presidential search that culminated with the hiring of an extremely qualified, enthusiastic college president. It can't be based on he's too involved politically, considering that one of last week's appointees was the wife of a Democrat state senator, which, by the way, I do not have a problem with. Being related to an elected official should not be a disqualifier. It's just a fact. Another appointee was a political party <clears throat> contributor. If it is not correct for one to conclude the sole reason Mr. Breidinger was not appointed is that Mr. Breidinger is registered Republican, the majority board. Democrat, please elaborate as to what is the criteria. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We do all that at the end, Mr. Warren, you know that. Jamie Walker. Okay, Mr. Schnee is only representing me, no one else that spoke before me. So you have that wrong. Number two, Mr. Schnee represented me when Central Fox brought the same legal action against me for trying to hide emails in Central Buck School District. That superintendent no longer works there. Mr. Schnee also represented me against Allison Beam when she put an illegal mask mandate on kids. She is no longer the health secretary. So you might want to like look into a bunch of those things before you 
further what you're going to do. Okay. I went on national television August 2nd, 2021, supporting the five of you. National TV, in the morning, it was a Monday morning, I think. Right after I went on TV supporting you guys, here's everything that I've endured. Number one, you changed all the health guidance. We won't even get into that. Number two, you came to my school and called me a, su a suicide trigger. I mean, my kids could have been there. That's fine. Number three, I've been called an insurrectionist. Number four, I've been called a conspiracy theorist. I was just was called one. First of all, I wasn't upset about masking guidelines here because they didn't implement ma masking guidelines. They changed quarantine guidelines, which kept kids out of school. So you don't have your facts right about that. Um, well, it was COVID-19. You, li I've been lied to face to face by government employees. Um, I was called Bucks County bad for emailing a, a Democratic committee woman. I was followed around this building for trying to find out who runs a Twitter account. Your office has used a million loopholes to deny right to know requests, which makes us put in more. Then you try to say, I'm asking for too many. You lost that. The Office of Open Records didn't even grant that to you. So saying that is wrong. Um, finally, you've used now my tax dollars to bring lawsuits against me. You can call it an appeal, but I have to hire a lawyer and go to court. Okay. I went through this. Thank you. Sarah Bauer. Hi, Sarah Bauer again from Doylestown. I live in Doylestown Township. I have been disgusted with the leadership of this county since August of 2021. First off, you changed the, math, the guidance of, according to the health department. You didn't listen to the health department. You did your own guidance. Then. You, I found out you brought a private citizen from calling the county offices. Why? Because you didn't like what she said? That's communism. Look it up. That, now I find out you're using my tax money to sue private citizens to not receive email? It's the silliest thing I ever heard. What are you hiding? You can't, you can't hide email. The truth always comes out. I hope you guys realize that. Truth always comes out, always. I don't like what's happening in this county under your leadership. I'll be happy when we have new leadership in this county because you are a disgrace to this county. Edward McHouse. Edward Mackhouse from Buckingham. So, as Jean said, it's good to get together, find out we can't change the past. There's been a lot of harm to children. It's not as bad in Bucks County as in Montgomery County about shutting down the schools, wearing masks. I read the Epic Times, EPOCH newspaper, EP, it, it sounds like Epic, EPIC. That is by mostly led by Chinese people who are suppressed in China. And they are fighting to keep the stuff like that goes on in China, like the harvesting of organs of people who dissent, like the type of things with the January 6th, where they had the farce of those hearings, and a million people went to, on January 6th, for honest elections. None of them were armed, and they were treated horribly and this, this, this farce of girl goes up and says that Trump jumped eight feet and was wrestling with the Secret Service in there. It's all observed, one-sided hearings. We have to have balanced two parties and look at these things, the suppression of what's going on. Like big pharmacy, billions of dollars. The abortion industry, billions of dollars. The right to life is only has millions of dollars. Dr. Raz has the millions, but it's not compared to the billions of dollars going to take away our rights and liberties and, and things. So we have to, so Dr. Raz, Mastriano are fighting for election integrity. Biden, Wolf, Shapiro, and Federman, they are destroying our country. They, have, they give millions of dollars in support from Facebook and stuff. And 
it's the it's David against Goliath. So do what the right thing is and, and give the information out and defend yourself. Oh. Rich Walker. Megan Brock. First, Mr. Khan, I wanted to address what Jamie said, that I don't have any legal counsel right now. You put me in a position where I'm either going to have to spend thousands of dollars in legal fees to represent myself, and I can't afford to spend more money on this, this fr frivolity that you're, you're doing. I wanted to also read, I know you said you didn't like that we said we'd been sued. This is the notice that you served me. I'm reading what you sent me. Notice, you have been sued in court. If you wish to defend against the claims set forth in the following pages, you must take action within 20 days. So I'm not the one who said I'm being sued. You're the one who said it. Additionally, what was the county's reason for initially denying the records? I don't really think that's been properly explained. It, it's the main reason that the OOR granted my appeal. And just to say, because I say so, isn't a valid legal argument. So your lawsuit still doesn't explain it, which really, when we talk about being frivolous, that's really quintessentially what frivolity is. So I would say you're the one being frivolous, not me. And then to Commissioner Jean, um, I know you, you said about, you know, it's hard to speak up about right to know law, yada, yada, yada. Let's do a simple one. The county wrongfully blocked my phone number for 18 months. I could not contact anyone in Bucks County government for 18 months. And then instead of apologizing, I was defamed in the newspaper to where the Bucks County Courier Times actually had to print a correction, right? And nobody defended me. I had to, through right to know, obtain the actual voicemail I left and play it for everyone. You defamed my character. Gene, where are you? How come you have not made a statement saying, I, as the Republican commissioner, denounce Megan Brock having her phone number blocked for 18 months? That is a, a restriction of her First Amendment rights. It was wrong. It should have never happened. And we'll make sure it won't ever happen again. How hard is it to do that? Why haven't you done that? I was asked on the Krista Gall show this morning what the Republicans have done to help me. And I had to say, Zero. No one's helped. Thank you. Anna Darmond. I'm going to see my time to Josh Hogan. No, I'm sorry. We don't allow that. You signed up. You have to speak. Okay. So some clarifications here. It is the job of the OOR to determine what requests are following the law and whether the request is valid. Mr. Khan, you are correct that you have the right to disagree and appeal, which means suing the requesters. As Megan pointed out, you actually, it's your office's own words that you are suing because it's going to court. But the point is, we are questioning why. Why are you doing this? You have said they made too many requests. There were too many emails to look at. This sounds personal. It sounds like a declaration of war on citizens and as if it should be a deterrent, as if the motivation could be to change the law, to make it harder for citizens to shine light onto what the government is doing. If y'all had just been transparent from the beginning, none of this would have been happening. Here are some stats for you. Why from 2009 to 2019, you had an 84% win rate with the Office of Open Records, and never once sued someone in common pleas when you lost. Since then, since 2020, you have a 70% win rate with the OOR and seven lawsuits against citizens. I appreciate the response that you take your time to give, and I would really appreciate eye contact right now, Mr. Khan, because it feels a lot like you're ignoring me on purpose, which is very frustrating but I'll keep talking and hopefully you'll open your ears. The words that you're saying sounds like an explanation, maybe mansplaining, okay? I don't accept that as a taxpaying citizen. I don't think that you're being honest and that's why we're here. And I'm sorry that that offends some of our taxpaying citizens, but we the people, I'm part of those people too. We the people, there's a lot of us who feel this same way. Thank you. Tanya Kovacs. Tanya Kovacs. Oh, okay. 
All right. Just to reference a couple things, um, comment was made about uh, the August uh, 2021 guidelines guidance imposing mask requirements. We actually didn't impose mask requirements. We um, made recommendations uh, to follow CDC. Um, we have explained ad infinitum the reasoning behind that, um, the fact that there was a telephone call with Dr. Damsker and the hospital network of Bucks County where they had extreme concern about the health of children uh, as they were going back to school, uh, which was what led to uh, the updated guidance because of the cases going up. Um, in terms, sorry, um, in terms of appointments to, to boards, you know, the board has the right, as Mr. Warren said, to make appointments um, to different boards and authorities uh, as we see fit. Um, I don't think there's anything else. Really. All right, we're going to move on to Commissioner Comments. Uh, Commissioner Marsegli. Um, I just had to clear up just one thing, just, and this is just for the public who's listening um, on the video. So the reason that sometimes we can't get the records filled and open record requests filled quickly and we need to appeal things is because there's confidential information in there. So I get hundreds of emails a day, which works into pages, but probably 70% of them are from people asking for assistance with a child who needs drug and alcohol help or someone who has a mental health crisis that they're in. It's someone who is involved with children and youth. So those names have to all be redacted. So if you could imagine the amount of work our open records officer has when they have 10,000 of my pages from a month, 10,000 of Commissioner Harvey's and Commissioner DiGirolamo's, and has to go through that page after page redacting the personal information, or if there's personnel information in there. So it helps when people get their requests to be smaller. And if they don't make the requests more specific and smaller, that's when we may need to appeal. I have to tell you, the amount of dollars, taxpayer dollars that have been spent on these repeated requests, it, it's extremely upsetting. And all the emails from August that they're asking for, they've had them, they've had them for a year now. So nothing new is coming out of this. This is just some kind of a public, I guess, stunt that we do at our commissioner meetings now. Um, there are a lot of important things going on in this county, a lot of things we need to deal with in 2022. We don't need to keep revisiting something from August 2021. Thank you. Commissioner Drella. Thank you. I, I, I think they talked long enough before. Uh, just a couple quick comments. Uh, I, one important thing more you said about the budget and figuring out what we're getting. Um, I, mean, I heard this morning good news that it appears they have an agreement as of right now. So the uh, Senate's going back in at 6 p.m. The House is going back at 3 o'clock for caucus, and I, I'm assuming that they're going to talk about the agreement, and it appears that they're going to start voting tomorrow. So possibly, hopefully, the budget hopefully will be done and the, and the pieces that go together with it by Friday or Saturday at the latest. That's what I'm hearing. So that's subject to change. And one last comment, I want to, uh, my daughter Mary's getting married on Saturday at St. from Church at 2 o'clock. So I just want to publicly congratulate Mary and her uh, fiance, Sean, on their marriage on Saturday. And uh, Are we all invited? Well, <laughs> we're all invited to the church, yes. <laughs> and wish them all the very, very best in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it is nice to see that uh, there are, seems to be a lot of interest in saving legal fees uh, for the county. Uh, um, I thank uh, Mr. Kahn for leading the effort here to change the way law, the law departments operated, because uh, we've been seeing, for the most part, savings. Um, the issue with... Um, you know, conspiracy theories, uh, and I'm not one of them. I've never subscribed to them. Um, even the, the biggest, most well-known, most popular, most talked about conspiracy theory about the Kennedy assassination, I don't believe at all. Uh, every single piece of evidence points to a single shooter, and that single shooter being Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, but unfortunately, because of 
the way this country has gone between Vietnam and Watergate and, and other scandals that have happened since then from people on both sides of the aisle, uh, there is there is definitely obviously a lack of trust um, up and down the board, you know, uh, from local government up to national government. Uh, the problem with those people who want to engage in conspiracy theories is that they box themselves in so that there's no answer they get which will satisfy them. Um, because if they don't get the answer they're looking for, it's just more proof that the conspiracy, you know, oh, it must go even deeper. Um, you know, it's... Uh, uh, my, my assistant sent around a cartoon, um, it was about a year ago, um, and I, I, I got it, not everybody else got it, but I got it, uh, which was uh, somebody who essentially uh, was not following guidelines, not, not taking vaccines, um, and was convinced it was a conspiracy. And, and in the cartoon, the person passed away. Uh, and the person's at the pearly gates and is talking to God and saying, well, you know, God, why am I here? You know, I was a good person. And God says, well, you should have taken the vaccine. And, and, and the person says, oh my God, the conspiracy goes higher than I thought. <laughs> you know? um, when you think you know the answers to all the questions and then you ask for information to prove um, that you, what you think is correct, if you don't get the answers, even though, as Commissioner Mercegle said, I don't know how many pages of documents have been given over over the past 10 months, um, it's just more evidence, oh, see, there must be more. I have to keep searching, I have to keep searching, I have to keep searching. Um, to create a theory that there is a conspiracy makes you a conspiracy theorist. You know? um, if it really is about children, um, I would suggest reaching out to your state legislators and senators uh, to make sure this budget that is passed, hopefully the next day or two, um, does what it needs to do to help children if you really want to help children, that's what you should do. Make sure schools get the funding they need, make sure mental health gets the funding it needs, make sure drug and alcohol uh, prevention gets the funding it needs. If you take a look at our agenda and actually look at it and care about what's on it, not just one or two items, uh, you'll notice where it says county expense, uh, there's a lot of 10%, 0%. That's because we get a lot of our money through the state. Um, if they allocate more money for mental health and more money, for drug and alcohol and more money for behavioral health and development of programs, uh, that's more money we can spend to help children of all kinds all over this county. Um, if you really care about children, uh, in the past two hours we've been here, over 700 children um, across the planet have died of starvation just in the two hours we've been sitting here. 700 kids. Um, there are a lot of charities out there you can look into. Uh, if you're want to dedicate your time, dedicate some funding, um, and you really care about kids, that's the place to do it. Mm -hmm. um, in the past two hours we've been here, 22 Americans have died of drug overdoses. Mm -hmm. 22. 22 lives gone just in the past two hours. Mm -hmm. if that's something you care about. Um, we do actually have, uh, for one more day at least, or today and tomorrow, our... Um, Opioid Advisory Committee is still taking public information, public input, about how to recommend to the county we spend the funding uh, that's going to be coming to us through the National Opioid Settlement. Uh, so I would encourage us to start focusing on the issues that challenge us, real issues that are challenging us, um, real problems that are facing us, all of us, regardless of party, in this county. We do have a homelessness problem. We have a housing affordability problem. We have a drug problem, and not just us, it's across the nation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get solved if we're pointing at each other and worrying about things that we imagine in our heads to be real problems, because then the real problems keep getting bigger. So I appreciate all the work everybody's put into today, uh, our staff, and I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn. There you go. <laughs> all in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you.